Okay. Welcome everyone to the second event of this Soil Seminar series. Uh, um, my name is Mario Blesa, I'm the last one, actually. But I'm here. <laughs> um, and I am here uh, helping my son to organize the Soil Seminar series during my sabbatical. And I want to take this opportunity to thank my son for inviting me here. for the work that she's doing with the logistics of the um, Okay, so today we have the enormous pleasure of uh, receiving two uh, guest speakers, uh, Elizabeth Pominelli and Mary Louise Pratt, who actually don't need presentation, uh, but protocol being what it is, I will just tell you a little bit about them. Uh, Dr. Pominelli is a professor of anthropology and gender studies in Columbia University and in her own work, or at least the ones that are in her webpage in the uh, department, uh, she has been working in developing a critical theory of Venice liberalism that would support an anthropology of the otherwise. Uh, her last two books are The Empire of Love, Towards a Theory of Intimacy, Genealogy and Carnality, and Economies of Abandonment. Social belonging and exhaustion in male liberalism. Dr. Pratt is silver professor in the Department of Spanish and Portuguese and Social and Cultural Finance at New York University. She has published widely in postcolonial criticism and theory, cultural studies, women and print culture, literary discourse and ideology, travel literature, and modern cross fiction. Her book, Imperial Eyes, Travel Writing and Transculturation, is a true classic and has been reprinted six times. So folks, I think that with these two speakers today, we are going to have quite a bit of food for thought in the evening. But before we start with this, I also want to recognize that uh, while we are hoping to have a good time, there are some people that are not having such a good time at this moment and are uh, enduring under the bombs. Uh, and so we don't forget that. Um, so one more thing before we start, and it has to do with the format of the, of the event. So Dr. Pavinelli will present us uh, some of her work, ongoing work, and then uh, Dr. Pratt is going to comment on, on the presentation. We are going to have a brief break of about 10 minutes after she do those commentaries, and then uh, we come back and uh, Elizabeth will engage those comments, and we are opening the discussion with the, uh, with the group. So, Without further ado, let's welcome Alicia Coyne. We also have some guests from Labrador um, via uh, Skype. Do you hear that? Newfoundland. Oh, hello. Oh, yeah, is that Escobar? Yeah. Hi, Arturo. <laughs> okay, this is very cool. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. I was just at Davis in the spring in this room thinking I couldn't wait to come back to Davis um, in this room, and so I'm just really thrilled and I'm particularly thrilled that uh, this time I'm with uh, many of my anthropological colleagues in a department, for those of you who don't know, is, which is really just singular and amazing. Um, and also uh, many of my students, one who, which is Mario, who I'd never met, although <laughs> uh, until a couple of days ago, which is all to say it, everything is good. Okay, so I'm going to start. Uh, that is wrong. That's okay. No, no. Here we go. Um, and this will take about 50, 50 minutes, I think, hopefully. Okay. In a rightfully influential um, and controversial essay, Depeche Chakrabarti asks how the geological concept of the Anthropocene affects history as a form of knowledge, as a savoir, about human time, being and human time, especially as geological time comes to dwarf human time, and with it, humanism and the question of the human as such. 
Depeche's meditations are particularly interesting, given, that, given his, uh, the fact that he began his career by rethinking capital through the concept of the subaltern, which led him to rethink historiography from the perspective of the South, and now perhaps to provincialize the human and humanism in the impending wake of what could be an environmental catastrophe of capitalism. Now, I've always had a certain fascination with scholars who are able to reflect on their own disciplinary conditions. While by doctoral training, I am, in fact, an anthropologist, I'm not someone who is known for thinking about anthropology as a form of knowledge, as a savoir, per se. Nor do I think I would actually be very good at it. I do think about narrative forms of the human and its otherwises. But I always do so vis-a-vis via, via a critical encounter with late liberalism, or what I've, uh, with liberalism, or what I've been more recently calling late liberalism. Let's see how it goes. Good. To grasp the global nature of late liberalism, it seemed to me necessary to approach it with two somewhat countervailing inquiries. On the one hand, I've argued, or I think, that we must ask, what is liberalism now? What is the nature of this form of liberal governance that we have been making and living within since the late 60s, and that seems to have reached a certain crisis in the wake of 9-11 and the financial crisis of 2008, namely a liberalism um, in which neoliberalism, neoliberalism emerged as a response to Keynesian stagflation, and liberal multiculturalism emerged as a response to anti-colonial and new social movements. Late liberalism, for me, seems to mark a period then in which the population, this idea of a population, would be secured by a new reading of society and the individual, a reading that ignored the people and their freedoms as a kind of truth speaking, and focused instead on the care of economic and cultural aptitudes and attitudes that claim to enhance the life of the population while maintaining flows of economic and cultural values from subordinate to dominant groups. On the other hand, I thought we had to ask, how is this thing that passes under a singular name, late liberalism, liberalism, not a singular phenomena, but a set of spatially dispersed tactics? So I was saying, I think you can see those stanzas, can't you, a little bit? It would be kind of, I was saying this afternoon, it would be cool to just keep on adding stanzas under there from various regions that would then rewrite the stanza, the top stanza. In any case, if I were to ask how the geological concept of the Anthropocene affects a form of knowledge, a savoir, for me the form of knowledge would not be, in the first instance, anthropology. It would be the critical ways we have thought about late liberalism, and more specifically, it would be about the concept of biopolitics and the biopolitical, which we have used so productively to critique late liberalism. And this is what I want to talk about this afternoon and this evening, using a concrete example, uh, using as a concrete example, a transmedia augmented reality project on which I, I and a bunch of longstanding indigenous friends, family colleagues of mine have been working. Before I dig into that project, and before saying what happens to biopolitical understandings of late liberalism, when put under the pressure of the geological concept of the Anthropocene, let me say a few things about the concept of the Anthropocene itself. The concept, the term Anthropocene, for those of you who don't know, many of you might, was coined by the ecologist um, Eugene Stormer, but then was widely popularized by the Nobel Prize winning atmospheric chemist Paul Crutzen. Crutzen argued that we have passed out of the Holocene the, which is the recent period, into a new geological age, the Anthropocene. He and others claim that a set of human activities has changed the geological destiny of the planet. Note the phrase, change the destiny. The Anthropocene does not imply that man had never before had an effect on the environment. Clearly, humans contributed to the great megafauna extinctions. They've uh, always... Uh, had a terrific, uh, been, uh, humans have always been very terrific at terraforming or geoforming local environments, that is, in deliberately modifying the atmosphere, temperature, surface topology, or ecology, 
in order to make a locale suitable for one form of life rather than another. In this way, we can, um, oh, that's the, that's the Anthropocene. So that's simply the argument that you can see uh, that in this particular period, there's been an intensification of all sorts of um, climatic changes that I'll talk about. Um, in terms of terraforming or geoforming, we can remember Bill Conan's fabulous book, Changes in the Land, which, showed that, which disrupted the narrative that colonists came to an ecologically pristine world. Cronin showed instead that both Native Americans and settlers terraformed or geoformed their environment, and that the battle for domination, for social domination, occurred at, at least in part, if not decisively, at the level of this geoforming. Or, for instance, take a more recent event. While on a helicopter trying to decide whether or where to let an international oil and gas company drill on their country, indigenous friends of mine and I discovered a vast network of stone weirs off the coast of Mabaluk. And this is, this is a little, um, uh, uh, what is that called? Point. It's a little point. Um, but I'll show you where basically it sits later. Uh, so that's water you see on one side and land. And all around this are these, this immense network of stone weirs, the fish traps. Um, built by their ancestors, but long since forgotten, we, we knew that we had found one when we were actually walking there. But when the tide was right up and we were in a helicopter, suddenly the whole damn thing was surrounded by these things. Um, built by their ancestors, but long since forgotten, and part of a complex geobio graphy that I'm going to talk about, including um, a, 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 a geography in which that, the top of that point is the tail of a Barramundi dreaming. So you can actually see that the whole thing is a Barramundi dreaming. Um, and the little creek, I think, come up little creek. Yeah, there we go. And the little creek um, at the bottom there is actually um, where a woman who dressed up as a man, did all sorts of things, laid down. So hopefully you can see her legs. There are other things there as well. Nor does the concept of, so the concept of the Anthropocene doesn't suggest that uh, humans have never before had an effect on their envi environment, nor that humans are the only thing that has an effect on the environment. Nor does the concept of the Anthropocene imply that changes to the climate have never before occurred. The mainstream science of climate change is fairly clear that the Earth has undergone periods of significant, significantly warmer and colder conditions. What the Anthropocene asserts is, first, that human activity is changing the destiny of the planetary thermostat, which places the question of whether the planet has or has something like a metabolism center stage. And joining this question, or this assertion, is another that is whether the enlightenment domination of Earth by the division between the animate and inanimate, that is the Earth as animate container of life, and then life as what moves around it and reproduces in it, is any longer persuasive. And second, the Anthropocene argues that this metabolic changing human activity began with the Industrial Revolution when huge amounts of hydrocarbons began being released into the atmosphere. This release has thrown off, according to this theory, has thrown off the Earth's carbon cycle, that is the cycle that regulates the warming and cooling of the planet, and potentially with it, the conditions of carbon-based life itself. So the story goes, carbon-based life made, or turned into, would be better, carbon-based fuels, that, and that some carbon-based beings consumed these carbon-based fuels, and in consuming them at such a massive rate, have potentially consumed themselves and all other carbon forms of life, or about to do so. The geologic disturbance of the Anthropocene does not merely, in this way of thinking, threaten human life, and it doesn't merely threaten carbon life, but it threatens life as it's currently defined. That is, it also threatens the imaginary subtending of what we call life. Thus, what, uh, or part of, I think, the arresting nature of the images coming back from Mars, Mars, Moon, this is Moon, Mars, oh my god, can our future be seen in the arresting nature of stone images of now lost water flow on Mars? Is our present in its future? Or 
in arsenic bugs. And finally, less explicitly, the Anthropocene embeds a form of knowledge, a way of knowing, in the practices and technologies of liberal capitalism itself. Geology, as a form of knowledge, as a form of assertion about life and its conditions and it ends, itself emerged in the modern form during the same period that saw the emergence of the Anthropocene. So if the Anthropocene begins when we start, the humans uh, take leftover carbon-based life condensed into hydrocarbons and starts using it at a massive rate. Then geology emerges at the same period. Why? Because miners started digging up these mass carbon seams. As they did this, they re revealed massive fossil fields in situ, allowing geology to create the geological timescales that then we now use to say we're in a new time. So all of this is marvelously ironic and utterly sickening, but at the core is a simple kind of thing, not merely human life and not merely carbon life, but a way of life and the hierarchies of life on which we've based this way of life is critically at stake in this concept of the Anthropocene. So what I want to so um, so what I want I want to examine two broad impacts on our biopolitical understandings of late liberalism when we take biopolitics as a quite useful tool I think but put it under the pressure of the, uh, or make it critically encounter the geological concept of the Anthropocene. First, I want, and I want to do two things basically. First, I want to think about how biopolitical critiques of late liberalism are themselves trapped in a carbon cycle. Second, I want to think about how current exits from this trap, the trap of the carbon cycle, are themselves potentially trapped in the tactics of late liberal governance, both in terms of the form that they take to get out of it and the mode by which they circulate these forms. Note, I'm talking here about a critical encounter rather than merely taking on board the concept of the Anthropocene. So we have to critically encounter this Anthropocene. We can't just say, oh, look, Anthropocene, now we have the answers. Um, given that the pressure within the actual deployment and discussion of the Anthropocene in many places and contexts has been to conserve rather than disturb the, the, the issues that I, I want to really foreground. That is, it's not merely human life and it's not merely carbon life, but it's a way of life, life and the hierarchies of value that they presuppose, which is being in some ways disturbed by, the anthro by a radicalized understanding of the Anthropocene. The other thing I want to do, and then I'm just going to start, is to note that I am gathering together, uh, and this is, this is, of course, a book-length project as per we all. Um, what, what's interesting about this project is that I'm gathering together, interesting at least to me, gathering together bits and parts and pieces of material that I've been writing about for a very long time. Indeed, stretching back, I think, to my first book, Labor Slot. So I've actually thought about doing chap using chapter titles by recycling older essays, do what rocks listen, et cetera. But in any anyway, case, OK, let's start. First, a critical encounter with the Anthropocene would foreground how one of our most powerful critical theories of liberalism, that is biopolitics, is trapped in the carbon cycle. No matter how we approach the relationship between Zoe and Bios, that is the very complex discussion of the relationship between bare life and life that's proper to a particular form of life, usually conceptualized as human life, but it could be any problem form of proper life, right? The life biopower thinks remains, I think, trapped in a carbon imaginary. Life remains defined by a metabolic rate, the capacity to grow, to reproduce, to have functional activity, and to change continually and then die. It remains the organic. It remains within an imaginary of the organic versus the inorganic, the animate versus the inanimate, and this will become important later, the opposition of carbon and mineral, entities that are synthesized by biological processes and those synthesized by geological processes. Our concepts of agency, of subjectivity, extend from these fundamental uh, divisions, the animate, the inanimate. 
Indeed, thus a radicalized Anthropocene would transform a humanist ontology in which I believe Zoe and Bio sit to, into a geontology. That is, this human ontology, biopower, would be a local arrangement of Zoe, Bios, and Geos. Of course, Zoe, Bios, and Geos, geontology, ontology, all of these terms are hopelessly entangled in a Western vocabulary. And if you, as I go along, if I try to bring in terms that were, did work, literally, Awa, Mia, Terwin, Rock, we wouldn't just simply be able to take these Emmy angle terms and substitute them for them. A very careful rearrangement of world would have to occur. But nevertheless, by simply situating, insert, sorry, simply inserting the geos into the conversation of Zoe and bios, or into the conversation of biopolitics, whether negative or positive, es, uh, esposito or agamben, puts enormous pressure on the presuppositions of contemporary critical theories of life and power. So, for example, in 2005, I began a discussion with elder indigenous friends and colleagues of mine who are still living at the Bellevue community. And just so you can see it, that, remember that young girl who lay down? That's where she is. That's Darwin up there, right? That's, Everything to the left is water. I realized that wouldn't be clear. Um, can you see? Oh, well, there you go. This makes no sense what I'm saying then. No, that's not very, see it. That's very subtle, isn't it? I'm very subtle. <laughs> Maybe if we just. Oh, there you go. Is that happening? Is that helping? Oh, yeah, now you see it. OK, can you see it now? OK, so everything to the left is water. Everything to the right is, but yeah, that's fine. Basically land. Yeah, that's perfect. Okay. And that where it says young girl, that's where that lady laid down. OK. Um, so in uh, 1905, I began a discussion with um, older, then fairly older, indigenous friends and colleagues of mine who are still living at Belle Yuen. Um about what I would do with the massive archive I had accumulated over the previous 20 years. Some suggested that I work with the Northern Territory Libraries that was helping communities start local brick and mortar digital archives. That is, archives that were digitalized and then put on dedicated community, uh, computers inside a community uh, with software that the various communities could um, utilize to restrict who could see what material. But several other women and men had another suggestion about what I do with my archive. They told me to burn it. If the form of life recorded in the archive were only relevant to an archival imaginary, then from their point of view, this form of life was dead and should be treated like all other forms of dead life. It should, a hole should be dug. The archive should be put in there, light a match, wait until it burns down, bury it, Stomp it down, walk away. For many years, some would know what this now traceless hole contained. Over a longer period of time, others might have a vague feeling that the site was significant, though some would continue to know because someone had thought it important enough to tell them. But if no one felt any obligation to this place, then it was dead, and the white people should come, lay concrete on top of it, and build a resort. I.e., as with knowledge, so with place. If the bio and geogra geographies had been severed between human and people, then, as far as they were concerned, the land should dry up and people would take the consequences. In 2007, just as in, I have to say, I, I didn't burn the archive. I was very, 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 very liberal at that moment. I just couldn't do it, which is itself fascinating. Um, so we, we, a bunch of us chose option one, which is to digitalize it, right? Now, just as this project was getting underway, a violent riot broke out in the community at Bellion. 
The cause of the riot was socially complex, mixed personal grudges within the legacy of a divisive land claim I'm going to talk about in a second. In the short for now, beset by chainsaws and pickaxes, 30 people walked away from Bill Ewan and well-paying jobs. And the people who walked away were the children and grandchildren of the key contributors to this archive. This is a slow thing. Is that up there? Oh, there's the missing girl. Yeah, sorry. The riot was reported in the local press. And the local labor government, then keen to demonstrate its commitment to indigenous well-being and avoid more bad press, promised this group um, housing and jobs in their traditional country, located some 300 kilometers south on a small outstation with very little infrastructure. That was then. But then two months later, this was January 2007, March 2007, the conservative federal government forced the release of a report into the welfare of indigenous children in the Northern Territory, part of which was discussed as the sexual abuse of children. The federal government, and it was called the Little Children Are Sacred. The federal government, facing a difficult national election, fanned a sex panic and declared a massive intervention in indigenous life based on what it called the failed policies of cultural recognition and support. From now on, and there's these big signs that were put all over all communities that basically, oops, I always get this wrong, there it is. Um, from now on, welfare payments would be forcefully managed, indigenous lands forcefully acquired, police would have a permanent presence on all indigenous communities, all children would be subjected to mandatory sexual examinations, indigenous people forced into work in cities where there was no housing, and outstations would be defunded. Overturning decades of discourse, um, the federal government, backed by specific indigenous and non-indigenous intellectuals and anthropologists such as Noel Pearson, Marcia Langton, and Peter Sutton, declared that indigenous culture was the problem, not the solution to indigenous well-being. The federal government declared liberal recognition, or what in Australia is called for reasons that just seem so ironic, self-determination, to be a failed experiment anticipating a similar claim that we then would hear throughout Europe by uh, Cameron, Sarkozy, and Merkel. That is, the, the multiculturalism is, was a failed experiment. For the federal government and this new hegemony that emerged, if indigenous people wanted money to support their rural lifestyle, which was now under the cloud of sexual abuse, they would have to get it through the marketplace. Sitting in tents on, the, on lands most of my friends barely knew, across a harbor from a pristine country where vast wetland, estuarine creeks, reefs, and dreaming narratives sat, the children and the grandchildren of the key contributors to my archive who had left the community heard that now no houses were going to come, no jobs, and nothing would be done to help them relocate in one of the most jammed and expensive rental markets in the country, Darwin. In the wake of this massive neoliberal reorganization of the Australian governance of indigenous life, without any housing or jobs, and in the fragile coastal ecosystem of Northwest Australia, my friends and I embarked on a quest to create a transmedia project at the heart of which is an augmented reality program. The basic technological principles of the project were and are fairly simple. Media files are, would be geotagged, so you give it a GPS marker such that they would be played on a smartphone or tablets in regions without phone networks and only proximate to a site, so you could only play this if you're proximate to a site, even as the same media file could be delinked from its location and moved across other formats and into other platforms. So you could make it into a movie and you could circulate in other ways. These media files, these geotagged approximate playing media files could be downloaded from a website much as one does with iTunes. Different pricing schemes would allow revenue production at the same time that the web-based nature of the historical and cultural information would be attracted to uh, th their children. The social vision was also fairly clear. The transmedia project would allow them to embed their geontological principles and practices into cutting edge communicative technologies allowing them access to information economies and allowing them to engage with their increasingly tech-savvy children. 
as selling point to environmentally oriented businesses was that the virtual nature of this medium would supposedly have minimal impact on the physical nature of the environment. In the hope of securing funds to create this project, the men and women, these about 30 people and I, created the Katabing Indigenous Corporation in 2009. So what is the geontology of the Katabing? If this is going to support their vision of a geontology, what is the geontology of the Katabing? And how does this help us understand the way in which uh, a biopolitical analysis is stuck in a carbon imaginary? That is, what are the arrangements, even if we stay within the Greek language, of Zoe, Bios, and Geos that subtend and would animate this augmented reality project? To answer, answer, the, answer this, we need to go back into time to the attempts of their parents and grandparents to manage the dislocations of settler colonialism and its ne necropolitics of murder, sexual abuse, addiction, and forced labor that stretches from the 1930s to the 1980s. That is, let's not look at the contemporary sex panic about indigenous people. Let's look at the necrotic politics of settler colonialism. After all, the geontology of this contemporary group of people is not theirs, nor is the geontological imaginary of their parents and grandparents in any way anthropological in a cosmological sense. That is, the geontology of their parents and grandparents is not, self not a self-referential and self-contained mode of life. And it is certainly not something that can be lifted out of a set of, that was most for those of you who don't know, that, who argued in or, 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 or Argonauts of the Western Pacific that the social literal oops is contained, is constituted by the circulation of objects. But you note how he closes the system. And then note how, whoops, how Levi Strauss, and this is his um, famous uh, mental cube, literally lifts it out. I was talking, this is kind of like Latour plus Slaughterdyke early. Um, it is not something that is a tradition, and thus their parents and grandparents weren't engaged in carting a tradition from one moment to another, but rather were engaged in an analytics, that is an analytics of power. And the analytics of power that their parents and grandparents were engaged in what pivoted on the question of whether their geontology could refashion the world as it was being made by settler colonialism. And in so far as it could, could it pull into being a different arrangement? Now, the specifics of their analytics is somewhat easy to outline. Can you see? Can you, yeah. OK, so that's the same place. Ish, you see that? OK. Those little dots are just people. I just apologize. I always think that this makes things clearer, like my diagrams, and maybe just makes it weirder. But in any case, supposedly, this is the standard history narrative. Supposedly, at some point, most of, oops, most of the, yeah, here we go. Most of the uh, Katabing's ancestors live south of Beluin. Disease, massacre, forced settlement, loneliness, desire, all led to the human depopulation of this region. That's a big, I should say, but by the way, this is a, yeah, this is a big Estrin Creek. Like, it's enormous. To go from that little dot, which is an island, over here takes about an hour, two hours on a boat. Um, Creating the image of, so this region was, people just slowly left, creating the image of a pristine and untouched area, right? Except for various invader species like pigs, cane toads, and et cetera. Now at stake for this deceased generation was whether they could refigure the world as a place of mutual obligation between biography and geography, even as they scrambled to survive the profound inhospitalities of assimilative and genocidal settler colonialism that had ruptured their previous alignments to a place. At the heart then of their geontology was the analytics of the interpenetration of bio and geography. That is, 
the interpenetration of substance, composition, and obligation. And I'm just going to move through this to give a sense of what they were trying to do, what they were trying to practice through as a thought. So let's take first bio and geographical substance. For these men and women, so going, yeah. For these men and women, various kinds of activities produce various kinds of substantive substances. Language, sweat, and blood, but also urine and other forms of secretions are produced during our, uh, kind of, and they would stereotype them during various practices, such as hunting produces sweat, ritual, blood and language, birthing, and burying. So each one produces a kind of stuff. E each activity also had and has its own embodied and rhetorical intensities and intensifications. So classically, anthropologists looked at ritual as a kind of intensification through poetics, uh, poetics of practice. But for them, all sorts of activities had modes of intensity and intensification. Speakers often use a shorthand to indicate these properties in their occasions of production. So for shorthand, these men and women would refer to sweat or mintara and language or mal as what they were talking about when they talked about substance. But what was put under analytic pressure, what they tried to figure out if it, how it would work in this new kind of place, and, and especially during the severe disruptions of the settlement period in which people were forced, chose, left, was the effect that all of these substances would have on the composition of a new place, that is, in relation to a new biogeography. Men and women theorized that various bodily substances, let's see, I might be behind on this. Yeah, this, this is them going up. Men and women theorize that various bodily substances sink into and become the compost, literally, out of which other substances gr grow, are eaten, and then return. Buried or burned bodies re-entered this cycle and re-emerged from often specific locations, but also in a kind of general making of place. Thus, the quip about, of the older women and men about burning my archive was within this geontological imagination, right? Burn it. Now, it, was a, it had a number of levels to the burning, i.e., put it back into where it came. It will still be there, right? It will have a productive effect, even if no one knows it, right? But that is where it belongs. So now let's take composition. The interpenetration for them. The interpenetration of, oh, here's, sorry, here's some substance. Here you go. These are different substances, like hunting. That's, that first one was hunting. <laughs> Can you see that? That's um, laughing. <laughs> That's doing ritual. OK, so yeah, right? Gee, isn't that helping? OK. Um, so let's say composition. The interpenetration of bio and geography vis-a-vis -vis substance, that's doing and right, composed the world, human world as a social geography for them, but also produced geography as part of what, or sorry, used geography as part of what produced humanness itself. The more persons moved around the same place, this movement etched into, there's the substance, remember, etched in to the earth, a trace and ends of that movement. Literally, the paths, indentations, barriers of stone and earth that created the spacings such that people could say this and that. The kind of deictic space that came, which people understood as composition. Footprint in mangrove, really. And for those of you who don't work in mangroves, they stick there a long time. And you can see whose foot it is, et cetera. Place and persons increasingly respond to each other as of habit. Literally, mangrove trees bend as of habit. And this habituated space comes to be where human generation begins and starts ending. Right? So it's actually not the anthropological imaginary of descent, but kind of up from. But always, always, this is com 
plexly embagonated <laughs> to some other elsewhere, that could become a new somewhere. And that's why these strings are at the end. Because it's never as the, 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 the imaginary of these tight properties with lines was not part of what was being analyzed here. In other words, by dwelling in and coming to know a place geographically and biographically, coming to know a place, sorry, coming to know a place, geography and biography become internal to each other insofar as each presupposes the substance and the form of each other. And again, this is not an idea. It's literally a substantial building correlation. People in place are not outside each other, but something that is stretched between them and looped through them. The, you know, the, you can think here either of the Deleuzian assemblage, and there's, again, these aren't the same thing. I'm happy to be more careful precisely later, or the Lacanian extimate. And this is how the last obligation was conceptualized. And this indeed was the point of all this making. That the creation of this mutually obligated thing, a geontology, was an ethical relationship that leveled being across forms of being, including what we would understand as the division between the animate and the inanimate. Now, insofar as these older people experimented with this geontological theory, and they, they did, they really, they put, they did things, and I can talk about that, what they did. But insofar as they experimented with this geontological theory, they made the children who are now the adults, who are now the kotabing, internal to the experiment, which leads to my second point. For the parents of my indigenous colleagues, Katabin colleagues, the end of this compositionality of locality was the formation of obligated matter as a means of transforming dislocation into proper dwelling. In other words, the point was not simply to extrapolate abstract theories of truth, but to pragmatically transform the geontics of space in order to make a place and a people who were internally made up of the same substance and thus bound to its compositional space and integrity and duration. If the process were successful, biographics and geographics would have to be responsive to each other because they were each other's estimate. They were their external interiority. That is, the mutual orientation of bio and geography, geographies would not be a function of choice, and this is important, or even responsibility, but of <coughs> obligation understood as a form of compulsion. Oh, that's okay. Did I do that? So sorry. <laughs> I turned it all off. I you did. Oh. This is. Play from current science. Yes, right on. Sorry. No, you're okay. Um, that is not a choice, not even a responsibility, but an obligation understood as a certain kind of compulsion. And written very clearly, I cannot help but think of my country. It cannot help but think of me. I cannot help but be habituated by it. It cannot help but be habituated by me. But this compulsion as obligation entailed a profound assessment of the meaning of nuanced interactions between human and, and again, how do you even say this? Human and non-human things. And thus, this, the, and, and this, the focus of attention and mindfulness at the borders and modes of being. So you're really looking very carefully at the nuances of trees and landscapes and winds, other people, what, what do they seem to have to do? How do they seem to be compelled to obligation? What got up for what? Karanteni karu. Why did a geological formation shift? A cloud appear, a creek clog with debris. What is the relationship between a territorial arrangement and my desire to marry this person? Indeed, part of the demonstration of mutual belonging on bio and geographies is, is the knowledge of a place, to know a place well enough to know what constitutes a usual and unusual occurrence. Right? So it's not you just look and know. You have to know it deep enough to know what's unusual. To think anything is something, could be something, is to be a child, speak, kind of like that's sad. To think that nothing could be something, that no rock moving 
is ever anything, is to be a very dangerous adult. But these geontological analytics, which have at the heart a deep ethics of obligation, met geontic forms of political legal governance and their disciplines. For instance, how is any of this just another word for animism and totemism? And thus, how is animism and totemism one of the exits that contemporary theorists are testing out to get out of the carbon cycle and biopolitics as trapped in a carbon cycle. The art critic Anselm Franke has proposed indeed that animism is the queer of a climatic future. So it's an exit ramp. That is, animism is an epithet that must be retuned as an anthem. And he's hardly alone. The new animism movement in philosophy, anthropology, and environmental ethics all seek to return to a discredited concept and reinvigorate it in the wake of the Anthropocene. Indeed, one could argue that Roberto Esposito's positive biopolitics, moving through the quasi or question mark vitalisms of Spinoza, is indeed a return to animism. All things that exist, exist as a finite attribute or modes of infinite substance. And as such, not only do they endeavor to persevere in being, they have the right to do so. How far does it, do we have a hierarchy here that stops when we hit a rock? Now, indigenous Australians are rarely called animists. Indeed, Tim Engel distinguishes, he's a, a very smart um, theorist and anthropologist, distinguishes the indigenous Australians from the North American Inuit on the basis of indigenous tendencies versus Inuit animistic tendency. So my family is totemist, and those of you who have Inuit families, your guys are animists. Indigenous Australians, Ingle argues, see the land and the ancestors and their ancestors as the prior source of life, whereas the Inuit focus on individual spirits as able to perpetuate life in existence. Uh, so for instance, that woman who laid down for him would be an instance of um, uh, the ancestors as the prior source of life. And yet, for all that the new animism is doing for us, and I, I'm, you'll see I'm not simply saying throw it out, it's hard to find two more fraught terms in the history of anthropology than animism and totemism. These concepts were born from and operated within a colonial geography in which some humans were unable or said to be unable to order the proper causal relations between objects and subjects, agencies and passivities, organic and inorganic life, and thus to control because they couldn't control the hierarchy of life, let alone distinguish life from non-life, could hardly control language and therefore had no possibility of reflexive reason. And indeed, animism and totemism have such, that's OK, that's what I kind of want. Animism and totemism have specific visual and sound aesthetics so suffused with various presuppositions about timeless irrationality that scholars should be properly wary of waiting anywhere close by lest they be sucked into the current. So this is what animism is in a kind of popular imagination. There's the lady way down. That's enough for you. Indeed, part of what makes our augmented, and I think this is really important, what part of what makes our augmented reality project, the one we're trying to do with the compelling to a market, but also to a public, is how primitivist overtones of animism slash totemism are mixing with cutting edge digital communication technologies. That's the frisson. It's a selling point. In other words, our augmented animist totemist thing is not outside late liberal governance, but nor was the totemism of their parents and grandparents. That is, if we want to take this exit ramp, we want to find a way, an exit from the carbon imaginary, we find that that road has already been constructed by late liberalism. And here we see very clearly. The geontological analytics of the Cotabing ancestors 
were in fact quickly absorbed into the law of liberal recognition. That is, as they were making this thing, the law of cultural recognition was happy to address them. Indeed, they celebrated their totemic geontologies. Indeed, the law of liberal recognition, which I've talked about before, demanded that supplicants to the law had to demonstrate a belief and an obligation to the belief that rocks listen and land responds as an animate agent. Im listen, im respond, im in listen us. Right? That's what they had to do. It's not like, oh, here's an exit ramp. No, the law was already waiting, saying, do you believe this unbelievable belief? Are you obligated by it? But the obligation to a totemic imaginary had to conform, as we now know, to strict parameters. It had to have a geographical inertness, a kind of inanimate animism, transmitted without change in narrative content or geographical reference from mytho to historical. And more importantly, the supplicants to the law, these older men and women, must not be allowed to demonstrate their ability to make use of their geontology as a historical analytics. In other words, a major analytic accomplishment had to be presented as a dumb totemic repetition. As we know, the dominant question of land rights of the land rights era and still today is not what people did to constitute belonging in dislocation, but where they had been before location. The law of recognition, and by this I mean a whole network of laws that in part were land right laws, but all the other kinds of bureaucratic um, and public uh, images that began to circulate celebrating this totemic exit, all were intended to force people back. So if that's where they were, sorry, that top is where they organized substance and tried to reground themselves, tried to force them back into history to where they had come from into a, to into a totemic clan imaginary. That was the point, push back from history. Thus, by foregrounding what they had accomplished, the parents and grandparents of the current Karabing foregrounded their distance from the law of recognition, their very self-determination to analytically deploy their geontology, remove them from the government's, uh, governance of self-recognition itself. Now, it's little wonder that their geontological analytic confounded the law. These men and women, these older men and women, most of, almost all of whom are now gone, were not, they're not gone, actually. I know, we know we're there. Anyways, these men and women were not thinking, acting at the level of the actual distribution of roles and parts, even if they were not explicitly political in a Western form of politics, they were acting at the level of the political insofar as they refused the division that was placing them in the world. If the division that placed him into the, the world of recognition was the division between the traditional and the modern subject, with the traditional subject's proper role and function to be past-oriented and changeless and just a dumb repetition of totemism, the modern subject's role and function was to be historical and analytic. And thus they crossed this di uh, di diagonally. They tried to pull into, wor into the world in which they lived something that has had a part, they were there, and yet had no part in the governance of that world. They tried to pull not a tradition into the world, but a geontology. And ditto now the current members of the Katabing. But if the current members of the Katabing are trying to pull into the world a geontology that, in, that both is a cause and consequence of their parents and grandparents. It is also a cause and consequence of the forms of late liberalism in which they dwell. And what I want to do in turning toward the, really the ending, end of this paper toward the end, is to look at the, the form and circulation that currently configure late liberalism as these, as the Katabing, analyze the possibility of mobilizing their geontology through an augmented reality program. And I'm just going to take some examples. For example, let's take perspective or visualizing techniques. Oops, that's not, where are we? Okay. The Quotinian technique of mental mapping, of, of learning place, 
we were taught by older relatives in Australia was in some ways very difficult, but also in some ways very straightforward. Everyone was told to stand there where you are not. If you said you like, uh, you know, you're supposed to know how to line up all these places, and you know, this with that, 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 and then that, and then you cross over, and there's that creek, and there, you, well, there's a water hole there. Well, how do you do that? And what people would say is, well, where are you standing? Like, what, where is, where is Bajilbuk Buk? Well, where are you standing? What do you mean where I'm standing? I'm standing right here. No, where are you standing? Stand, are you, go stand at Melik. So you stand at Melik in your head, where you're not, but where you know how to locate yourself, because you know that place, and then to look around. Where are you facing? In what direction are you moving? And as you do it, you know, the idea was, and they keep on telling you, move around, then go there. If you're there, then stand there, and then where are you going, right? And after you've done it, they would say, now, what did you just draw? How can we draw? What did you just draw? Look at it. What does it look like? Take that, stick it down, just take it, put it down at Malbalook, where you've never been, and you will see what it is. And then they wouldn't tell you what it is. But anyways, you will see what it is. And they just like grin at you. Same kind of thing with territoriality and marriage and ritual and friendship. I mean, it's very interesting. It's like the, you had to learn how to diagram, look at your diagram, be able to mobilize it and put it in somewhere. And it's very flat country. There's no perspective up there. Take augmented reality. That is, the technologies we're going to be using um, or have been using. That is, the view from nowhere, a planetary understanding of the Earth. Now, note, none of this is a planetary understanding of anything. And what I kind of like about it is that it's just there. I haven't even, I didn't do one of those maps which give you Australia and give you the territory and they give you this place. No. Planetary, planetary view of the Earth. The view from, classically, the view from nowhere the neutrally, socially, and culturally deracinated gaze, the view that reminds us we are members of the same Earth. Now again, this is not the same Earth we are all members of. And in fact, I'm hoping that this substance, compositionality, and obligation is really pushing against this cosmological framework. The ability to turn the page, the ability to superimpose data, such as GPS, data depends, of course, on the assignment and depends on the assignment of a number to every possible surface area of the Earth with these numerical values existing independent of any changes on or in the land. Right? The position of these cartographic lines produce at once in the same time then a kind of hyper-historiography and an anti-historiography as the conditions of a geological truth. Right? You, in order to know geology, you have to have these points that are both uh, marking how history can unfold and yet are extremely neutral and agonist, um, and uh, uh, whatever the word is with an A, in relation to history itself. And this cosmological gaze, as Hannah Arendt noted, also depended on a rebellion against the Earth rather than a new obligation to it, that is, this pulling up of satellites. Thus, abstracting humans out of their dwelling and out of this geontology that the older relatives were putting in the world, abstracting humans out of this geontology as a, as a means of conveying this geontology is at stake here in this mode of circulation. That is, the kind of augmented textualizations will necessarily circuit through a system that abstracts these texts in order to make them available approximately. It works by abstracting, that is, GPS works by abstracting all dwelling from the condition of dwelling as such. Now, but visualization is a technique and a technology that depends on forms of abstraction, not actual abstraction, but ways of canalizing, embedding potential otherwises in forms that are experienced as abstractions. That is, there are technologies of visualization as much as there is just visualization. 
The very means of augmenting alternative geontologies like ours circulates through current deployments of technological mediation and the habitual ways in which we experience that mediation. The most obvious point here is that GPS, GIS is a part of a vast network of militarized surveillance. Late liberalism mark, and late liberalism itself marks a period in which the population is said to be or begins to be secured by a new reading of the society and the individual in which the care of the economy and cultural aptitudes and attitudes is claimed to enhance life and now especially in the current crisis of ecological impending ecological disaster. Right, so now actually part of the military surveillance is environmental change and the effect of environmental change on the security of, in this case, the US. The environmental sciences are themselves, as I've said, a condition of and currently trapped within this system of governance. So GPS and GIS-based systems were exactly what allowed the geological sciences to coordinate geographically based information to other forms of metadata so that they could see and prove changing in carbon and ozone emissions and the melting of the ice polar caps and et cetera. We could do the same thing with software. That is, moving through software allows us to do this as the same kind of presuppositions that are at least counter or not, uh, don't coordinate with the geontology that we're trying to embed in here. But we also need, if we're going to do this, it's not just the market, but not just this securitization as a military, and state function, but also through a market apparatus. That is, if we're going to embed a geontology in smartphones and smart tablets, these smartphones and smart tablets need rare earths. Right? Rare earth is critical to new communication technologies. So are metals and fuels that, that, that are used to manufacture and thus literally hold our, our alternative geontology. And also, of course, the mental labor that goes into making it run, the software. And uh, as I alluded to or in earlier in this talk, when I said that my Cotabin colleagues and I were viewing a vast network of rock wares or rock, fish traps woven around Mobiluk from a helicopter, that helicopter was paid for by a mining company which seeks to drill for gas on these lands. The field trip was arranged by the Northern Land Council, a statutory bureaucratic body under the Land Rights Act, the same act that displaced them from the lands their parents and grandparents were geoforming, right, and trying to do their uh, analytics, and then pushing them back into country that has no infrastructure that's forcing them to make a decision about whether to mine their country, not merely as a means, of course, for their local benefit, but mining for the, the, a more dispersed way in which more people would have cell phones and tablets. And this field trip sits in the vast shadow of mining in Australia that feeds the voracious appetite of Chinese manufacturing, we hope, right, we hope, and said to be responsible for Australia's miraculous weathering, nay prospering, in the wake of the 2008 financial crisis, because it did, it missed it, because it's turned itself into a mining company. Uh, yeah, it's turned its state into a mining company. Right. In other words, to materialize this project, we might have to rip up, if not the lady who laid down, particularly, then some other lady. And here we come, I think, to the heart of the matter, and where the exit, the problem of exit really shows up, and where I'm going to close. The emergence of China as a major manufacturing power and all of us as a consumer of these kinds of goods, including technology products, forced the Prime Minister of Australia, Julia Gillard, to remind wealth bloated mining magnets, because Australians are sure, they're Canadians, anyways, that the nation, and she got up and she said in Mineral Week 2012, the nation owned the minerals, not the miners. But if the security of the nation depends on the capitalization of this substance, then Gillard is really not, it's making a difference that has no difference. But there are other women who are also seeking to make a difference. The woman, as a creek, is trying to make a difference. Another woman who is trying to make a case for why this creek's persistence 
should matter is also there. In taking her, these other women's right to exist into their equation, not only are the current karibing themselves the material manifestations of the parents and grandparents experiment, they are also lifting and insisting that a new form of geontology persist even, in so, even though pulling it into being circuits through all these networks. That is, they are also a spacing within the late liberal Anthropocene. In leaving a seemingly failed space, Belluin, they brought to this new place the promise that lie beyond this failure. Indeed, they operate as a unity across the very divisions on which the law now dis the, the law that disrupted their parents' geontology. And it might be useful now to say what Katabing refers to. The Katabing are, in fact, not, that's the same thing. The Katabing are, in fact, not a language group, not a descent group, not a territorial designation. They are not even entirely indigenous, since I'm also a member. Katabing is a state of geological affairs. It refers to the moment when a tide, the tide has reached its lowest point, revealing in the process underground roads and waterways and those possibilities of movement that don't exist prior to the dropping of the tide. If the Katabing's parents and grandparents produced the conditions for the members of the Katabing to experience themselves as a proper group, independent of the law of recognitions parceling them up, they then use this as a way of trying to overcome a new set of dislocations when they forced to, were forced to return to their lands that many of them had never been to. So if they had to go down and be parceled out according to clan, what we actually see is that although this geontological analytics failed on one level, because these folks oops, operate according to the law that way, they also operate according to their own sociology this way. And they include that woman as part and parcel of someone who has a say. Thank you. to spend time with this text and think about it. Uh, my idea of the role of the respondent, the, the uh, obligations of the respondent, the responsibility of the respondent, is to underscore the ideas that, and, clar and, and add into the ideas that are present in the paper, underscore the ones that I think are the most, that I see as the most, as consequential and, and important, and to add in, complement them with other things um, if, um, that I, if I have anything to offer. Uh, before I start, I want to welcome um, some, our absent interlocutors. I want to welcome Arturo Escobar, who's, uh, welcome back, Arturo Escobar, who's here listening to us. I want to welcome the colleagues in, in uh, St. John's. And I want to welcome someone who's here, Cristina Rojas from Ottawa, the University of Ottawa, who flew all the way here to attend the seminar. Um, so the, uh, the frame that Beth introduces here is the idea of the anthrop 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 Anthropocene, right? A new era of geological time um, inaugurated by the fact that human, by the recognition of the fact that humans have now altered the destiny of the planet. And to grasp this idea, she says, humans, and especially humans inhabiting Western liberalism, now have to stop thinking just about themselves and from themselves over and against a thing called nature. It's no longer possible then to think of nature as existing independently of us. It also means stopping thinking of humans as the only thing that really matters. Um, it means giving up on the idea that evolution or divine will or some other thing has placed the planet in the service of the human species. Um, in, in other words, Western subject, and this is my language, not Beth's, and I'll be interested in um, how it echoes. Western subjects are called upon to stop being humanists. And this is a huge problem, a very difficult task, especially for academics. We do not know how to stop taking that humanism for granted. 
There may be an irony here in that to grasp this idea of the Anthropocene, you have in a way to become a hyperhumanist. That is, you have to see the impact of the human of, of, of the human of humans everywhere, everywhere, even when even where there are no people at all, especially where there are no people or are no longer any people at all. Western humanism did believe did believe that the destiny of the planet was ours. It was to be inhabited and used by humans. But the narrative was that the planet would thrive under our husbandry, right? That, and instead, you have what Beth calls, pointed out today is the impending environmental catastrophe of capitalism. The su that suicidal story has been unfolding for quite a while, and it's been held at bay, unforgivably, I think, by thinkers as well as politicians. Despite the fact that there have been many, and still are, many Cassandras on the burning towers calling out the truth and waving their arms. And I think that impending ca ca uh, catastrophe is perhaps the ultimately the principal framing for um, the conversation today. And the question becomes, how is that to be lived? Or as Marisol said at breakfast this morning, how is it to be died? Now, I think it's not that neoliberalism, or what Beth calls late liberalism, um, and I like that term. Um, it's, an, it's an interesting one, because lateness is a more palpable thing now than, even now than it was when Fred Jameson started talking about late capitalism. It's not that late liberalism has failed to respond to capitalism's environmental threat. It's that it has responded but it has responded in a neoliberal, free market capitalist way by doubling down. That is, it says, if everybody knows that the oil is going to run out, or the titanium is going to run out, or the copper is going to run out, I, the neoliberal I, need to get my hands on as much of it as I can right now and make whatever profit out of it I can make before somebody else does, or before states raise the ante, or environmentalists make rules that get in the way. That's the response. It's a doubling down response. So within free market liberalism, the awareness of impending environmental catastrophe accelerates the process of extraction, commodification, and consumption. And that's entirely consistent with the logic of free market capitalism, or so it seems to me. Remember Locke's foundational argument for settler colonialism. If the existing inhabitants are not exploiting the land to its full profit-making potential, it is the duty to, to, of the capitalists to take it away from them so that it can, so proper use can be made of it. The failure to exploit was unfair to the land itself in this construction. And that thinking still prevails today. For example, mineral and gas leases today normally contain a provision that the lessee has to begin exploiting the leased resource within a certain time frame or they lose the leasing rights to it. The same thing is what, it's the same thing Locke said, use it or lose it. And these are the rules of development and states in developing countries, willingly or otherwise, are pretty much obligated to uh, enter into this game. It's important to note also though, something that Beth points out in her paper that developed settler, ex-settler ex colonies, like the US, Canada, and Australia, are also doing this now to themselves. They are carrying out accelerated, hyper-exploitation of extractable natural resources in their own hinterlands, as well as becoming ever more voracious predators abroad. Beth spoke about the mining uh, boom, in, uh, the mining boom in Australia. Uh, in Canada, it's the oil sands. In U.S., now it's fracking in rural areas and offshore and domestic oil exploitation, exploitation especially in Alaska. Um, the mine is going on in Australia. In my home country, Canada, we have our first full-blown right-wing neoliberal prime minister right now, and he's a product and an instrument of the Alberta oil sands economy. As a way of intervening in this global scenario, Beth invites us to think of neoliberalism or late liberalism as not a singular phenomenon, 
but a set of spatially dispersed tactics. And this, I think, is a key opening because, in a way, it's neoliberalism's blind spot. At, that, at this point, we have to recall that, that the, the free world global planetary free market project, the New World Order, um, and its institutional agents, the World Bank and the IMF, were born in a specific time and place, the Conference of Bretton Woods in 1944, where the first world countries arrived at an agreement on creating a global free market economy that would lead to world prosperity. The scheme was put into effect in 1958 when the European nations made their currencies exchangeable, effectively inaugurating a global open market that drastically limited the ways that nation states could defend their own interests or protect their citizenries. As Beth point, it says in her paper, the system began unfolding in the 1960s, and you'll remember that it just kept on going. And in 1995, Bill Clinton added a, uh, a, new piece, a missing piece, the World Trade Organization, um, which was one of the original goals of the Bretton Woods thing. Now, Beth observes that the vocabulary of biopower and biopolitics inaugurated by Foucault has provided one of the most illuminating instruments for critically grasping the workings of this system of liberalism. And Beth's big question, one of her big questions, because this is a paper that's full of wonderful big questions, uh, which is big, uh, that's important. We need the, the BQs, the big questions, have to be on our mind at all times. Um, one of her BQs is, <laughs> what happens to biopolitical understandings of liberalism when they are put under the pressure of the geological concept of the Anthropocene? What happens to biopolitical, the biopolitical critique of, leo, of liberalism when you, you bring into play the concept of the Anthropocene? Um, that is, the, um, the recognition that the same forces that produce Western liberalism have produced the conditions for the demise of all, of, not of all humanity and all carbon-based forms of life. Um, that observation, that is the permanent alteration of the planet's metabolism, the carbon cycle, by the rises in temperature, that observation puts on the table another of the BQs. In the, her, one of the big questions, in the Anthropocene, and Beth asks us, and I'm going to ask her later to uh, elaborate a little more on this claim, does the West, does, in the Anthropocene, does the West's foundational ontological distinction between animate and inanimate hold up as a frame for grasping and acting on the world, or does it become an obstacle and a trap which must be exited in some way? She suggests the latter. And I'm, I want to hear a little more about that. Um, the Western concept of life, she points out, the Western concept of life is tied to the, to the concept of death. Only things that can die can be said to have life in this schema. And when they die, they are said to no longer have it. This is not a universal, as Beth points out. This is not a universal. And she seems to suggest that the Anthropocene raises the need for other conceptualizations of life that are not limited or tied to animacy or the capacity of death, which may be ideas that exist in the carbon cycle. But I may be misunderstanding her here. Foucault works within the West. He's been criticized that many times. He works within the West and not coincidentally, as Beth observed, he works, thinks within the carbon cycle. Biopolitics and biopower, she argues, are concepts trapped in the carbon cycle. And non-Western and other attempts to get out of the carbon cycle get trapped in liberal forms of power. So you have what she diagnoses or lays out there as a predicament, a literal, not a dilemma, a predicament. Um, liberalism is trapped in the carbon cycle. Efforts to exit from the carbon cycle are trapped in liberalism. That's a predicament. The concept of the Anthropocene is trapped there too, she says, and needs, therefore she needs to be radicalized. There has to be a radical, critical encounter with that concept. 
And this, the, that's the encounter she tries to construct in her case study. It's an encounter informed by an indigenous ontology, that of geoontology, that of the Australian group with whom she has been working and living for several decades. And this leads her to the concept of geoontology, or geontology, as she says. That is, an ontology in which Zoe, Bios, and Geos, I never know why we, we have to only have permission from the Greeks to have any thoughts at all, but anyway, <laughs> there they are, the Greek terms, uh, Zoe, Bios, and Geos, that, um, in which those are co-articulated, animal life, meaningful life, or no, life, bare life, meaningful life, and the planet, the life of the planet, the Earth. Um, the Australian group that she discusses operate with such an ontology, a geontology, and it has provided the tools for what she calls to, and this is a phrase I love, a science of dwelling, which they have worked out in the course of their encounter with the unfolding encounter with settler colonialism. This, this science of dwelling, as she shows, continues to work across generations, including among the young generation with whom she's working today on the Augmented Reality Project. Now, I've been, I've been studying contemporary indigenous thought, and so I, what I wanted to, one of the things I wanted to underscore is that Beth is making an important claim here about indigeneity that's worth underscoring because it helps exit the primitivism trap. Speaking of the parents and grandparents um, who dealt with the arrival of settler colonialism in Northern Australia, Beth challenges the, convention, the conventional description of what they did, which, which would be preserving traditional culture. Con continuing to do the things they always did insofar as that was possible in, in what she calls a dumb totemic repetition. That's a polemical phrase that she uses. Because what she wants to say is that they dealt with settler colonialism by working out, which is not nothing to deal with, it's like the end of the world, right? Dealt with settler colonialism by working out a cultural analytics a deliberate reflection on their way of life in their altered historical circumstances. And on the basis of that, mapped a way forward for themselves and their children, a science of dwelling, <laughs> as Beth puts it, a continuously evolving way to, and this is Beth's beautiful phrase, to create belonging in dislocation, which is a huge challenge. What gets called today indigeneity, and this concept of indigeneity is ex extraordinarily generative right now and, and um, uh, evocative. What gets called indigeneity today is often read as the effort to hold on to what was there before, which is encoded as tradition. And many indigenous thinkers use this language and see it this way. But Beth proposes defining at least some of the time, it needs to be defined differently, as reflected, perhaps even, an even strategic response to the predicament of settler colonialism, an analytics that produces a science of dwelling that provides the next generation with a form of belonging. Um, at this point, it's probably worth remembering that indigeneity is a relational term. That is to say, nobody starts out indigenous. You become indigenous. Indigeneity happens when somebody's there and somebody else arrives out of the blue. Only in the encounter does, is, does anybody become indigenous. Otherwise, before that, you just are who you are. So when someone else shows up uninvited, um, they say, ah, you were here first. You are now indigenous. All the, vocab all the terms to describe this, Aboriginal, First Nations, they are all about who was, someone who was here first, which is a position de and that is, can only be described in relation to and from the point of view of the person who came after. Okay, so indigeneity is, no, is a bound concept in that way. The problem, um, Beth says, is that the work of the indigenous, of indigeneity, 
gets trapped in or easily gets trapped in or entrapped by the liberal political formations in which it, it unfolds. Indigenous people are constantly pushed to perform their otherness along what she calls strict parameters in order to gain access to liberal recognition. Beth says these parameters include a kind of, often include a kind of frozen in time inertness, in, often immobility in place. And this is important. Liberalism, and I'm, I, don't, I may be misreading her argument here and she may want to correct me, but it's, I think what she's saying is that liberalism conveniently reads the geontology of embeddedness in place in geography, the interpenetration of the human and, and, and geographical world, as a request for immobilization, as a request for staying here, having this place. And that is, becomes the recipe for reservation systems, for various forms of sequestration that keep people and their ideas in their place and deny them and their ideas access to the intellectual commons. Keep people in the totemic, in the animistic, in the pre-modern. That's another phrase that runs around in this terrain. Even the best intentioned, deeply thought work on indigeneity easily, all the time, reproduces that, that idea unreflectively. So the failure to grasp that this ge geontology is a science of dwelling that can travel. This, there's a failure to grasp that the science of dwelling can travel. It can move. And that's exactly what happens in the example that she gives. Your, your ancestral lands may be the place that you arrived at two years ago, and you have embedded yourself there. And, and then if, you, if something happens and there's a rupture and you go somewhere else, you do the same thing there. In other words, it, it, is, a, it, is, a, it is a thing that can travel. It is knowledge meant to travel. It is out, outward reaching, which is why the, the uh, project, the Augmented Reality Project, makes sense. It's an outward reaching, extroverted um, kind of science of dwelling. Um, it can be taught and learned, which brings me to my next point. Um, the interpenetration of the bio and the geo is a very suggestive way to speak about the inseparability of self and place that many indigenous ontologies share. Marisol de la Cadena was, was, gave an example at the anthropological meetings of the people she works with in the in Andean Peru, who, where the language is, you, you don't say, I am from this place. You, you, people say, I'm not from this place. I am this place, and this place is me. Which again, doesn't mean that you can't move. It means that where you move to, that's what it is. Um, but I think it would be an error to think that this kind of geontology, this kind of deep interpenetration between place and humans, where place and humans mutually define each other, I think it would be a mistake to think that this is not found in the West. I think people all over the world, including in the West, have embedded relations of this kind with particular places and acquire the ability to form this kind of relation with the places they inhabit. There's nothing inherently indigenous about such knowledge or the way of being underlying it, but the indigen indigenous peoples, some of them, not, this isn't a pan-indigenous characteristic either, but indigenous peoples precisely out of the, the predicament of settler colonialism become the ones who, the experts, they become the ones who codify and collectivize this knowledge this, in this way of being, reflect on it, fight for it, continually find ways to execute it in constantly changing circumstances. Whereas in the hegemonic selfhoods of the West, it's suppressed. You might have it, but it's not, nobody values it. And it's, if anything, you, um, it's, it's incompatible with, uh, it's, it's not functional for flexibilized capitalism, and so it does, it's a, it's a subalternized or marginalized form of knowledge. Um, so that takes me back to neoliberalism as a spatially defer, dispersed phenomenon, which Beth said in the beginning. The Bolivian Aymara sociologist Pablo Mamani argues that within global uh, neoliberalism, 
indigenous people have tended to become strategic populations because they have the ability to territorialize conflicts, to bring them to ground. This lake, this mountain, this stream bed, these bodies, these cancerous organs. Um, now, Mamani, uh, his book is called Geopolíticas Indígenas, Geop uh, Indigenous Geopolitics. Um, he's one of, um, he exemplifies one of the most uh, distinctive dimensions of today's indigeneity, which is a flowering of intellectual work. And this is the area that I've been working on. My background is in literary studies, and so I'm working with thought. Um, indigenous thinkers at geographically distant places are engaged in ambitious foundational projects of the kind that Beth is describing, entering voids left by collapsed narratives of progress, and entering new kind of speculative spaces like this that are brought in, have been brought into being by challenges to the Western monopoly on human ideas. Um, and this expanding body of work includes a continuous stream of what Anat Singh and Friction calls ideas meant to travel, that is extroverted programmatic thought that actively is recruiting new audiences, both indigenous and non-indigenous. Um, and uh, the scope and care and, of care and concern in this work tends to be planetary and cosmic. What, uh, what is at stake is not just the well-being of our particular group, but the future of indigenous peoples all over the world and then of the planet and of humankind as a whole. And this is all entangled together. We're all in it together in this, in this work. I use the idea of the extroversion to talk about the outward reaching um, character energy of, this, of, these, of these projects. And I think the augmented reality project Beth describes is, is one of those. It's a way of getting out of the versions of sovereignty and multiculturalism that corral indigenous ideas and keep them that in, on, the res, on the reservation, out of the mainstream, prevent them from becoming prescriptions for or uh, uh, channels of act, prescriptions for um, others, for everyone. Um, now, I was going to go on to describe a, a, another a work from uh, by a, um, a, a Bolivian text that was uh, a Aymara text that had a, kind of some of the similar characteristics here, but I think I'll save that for the seminar tomorrow uh, because we're we have it's twenty to six. And I think we are allowed a small break, and then we will <laughs> return to discuss it. But first, 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 my questions for Beth. They're quick. Question one, can you explain again why the West's, West's mapping of the animate and inanimate is called into question by the Anthropocene? I just want to ask you to spell that out. Question two, explain the following phrase. This is a quiz. <laughs> explain the following phrase. Animism is the queer of a climatic future. I love that and I want, I want to know what that is and I put it on a t-shirt. Okay. Okay, Envir now question. Environmental science, you say, is also trapped in liberal forms of government. Is there anything that isn't trapped in this way? And, and is trapped the word? Is it the figure? that we want. Some traps are inescapable. Um, some aim to kill the thing that gets trapped. Others, like minnow traps, came, aim to keep it alive. Um, fly catchers aim to kill the fly. Craw, claw traps aim to immobilize the, the, the animal so you can get its fur. What kind of trap is it? And is that the right figure? And, um, and lastly, I think your answer to this is no, but is indigenous ontology necessary to be able to make this move of radicalizing the Anthropocene, and is it sufficient to do that? Um, and how do your examples bear that out? This, that, that felt like exam questions. <laughs> okay, I hope they're useful, and I look forward after the break. How long is the break, Mary, Marisol? Ten minutes. Ten minutes, and then we'll come back and. Uh, for discussion. Thank you. Okay, we're ready to go.
Publish it anywhere, anywhere. But his argument is that um, that the how to think the animate in something like geology. And I'm pushing him. I'm pushing this farther than he actually may. I think he'd be fine to push it this far. Um, queers theory in queers life. So if you if you think about a pen as animate, or a stone as animate, he thinks that would queer the arrangements of being. Okay. Yeah, okay, so that's, that's, that's it. Um, third, environmental science is trapped. I think that's exactly right. I mean, uh, um, what do I mean by trapped? Uh, and, you know, the easy way out is to say all of those ways in which you defined it will do for me. And, but I also think that's kind of true. But, but what I'm thinking figuratively is not trapped to kill, but taking the energy of and redeploying it toward. Right. Um, so, for instance, uh, this incredible analytics, and you're right, it was an incredible analytics, it, you know, what these older folks did. And I actually, it, the chapter in Cunning of Recognition, I talk about it in Poetics of an Archive. The, I don't know what that chapter is called. Poetics? Poetics of Ghosts. Yeah. Um, all that energy was taken and redeployed toward recognition, the politics of recognition. And in Economies of abandonment, when I talk about these projects of recycling, radical fairies, of friends of mine who are radical fairies down in Tennessee, where they, the idea was to take what was then waste, they used cooking oil, and filter it and turn it into uh, uh, energy to run local generators on this, these radical fairy communities. All that, the, what was originally alternative biofuel projects, was trapped in the way you trap an animal, and then you use it for a new, bigger economy. So the emergence of 
biofuels as a large market. So I mainly, I mainly mean trapped in that way. Okay. Um, fourth, is indigenous sun energy necessarily sufficient to make Anthropocene? That, that's a really interesting and big question that comes to uh, other points that you were making. Um, and particularly about, for me, I would rephrase it, I think, in line with you, and then we can open it up, is that is what I'm talking about a cosmology and is it cosmic? That is, I think you're right that this dwelling science, and I actually I think it left it out when I was talking, um, but it, as a dwelling science, is a dwelling science that <laughs> Was, is meant to move, it, right? That's exactly right. It has conditions of movement, and it's meant to move. And it is also extrovert, what did you say? Yeah. Extroverted. Extroverted insofar as you're exactly right, is that people, people are, and radical fairies are extrovert. We think this is better. We think this produces betterness, right? We think if you listen to us, it would be better. The, 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 the conditions of life would be better. Okay. But I don't know if it's cosmological in the sense of the kind of post-Kantian vision of the earth as that in which we all inhabit. And even as there, there's no way in which we can't be all members of the same earth now. But I think there's at least a tension there that I, that at least folks that we, who we're thinking with, who I'm thinking with mm -hmm. and working with is open. Because, and again, if so, it's like, again, this other kind of trapping that happens, which I think is quite interesting. That's why I try and leave that weird picture in which you see this line, but we don't already coordinate it to um, the, uh, this kind of GIS, GPS, cosmologically considered thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. But, so, so let, shall we open to questions for a everybody? Yay. Comments? There are other things that are so incredible. I love your double down. That's exactly right. And we should also note that the neoliberal response to environmental catastrophe is, on the one hand, securitization, but carbon credits is a way of using the market to respond to what the market's doing. It's just, it's mind boggling. Yeah. Oh, that's right. Yeah. yeah. So I was thinking about um, industrial revolution, geology, um, and if you look at if you look at sort of early nineteenth century British writing about writing about geology, sort of just um, like post while, um, there's a lot of analogizing of what's going on with the making of carbon-based rocks to the processes of labor, right? So that you have like they thought little animals that were working to make to make rock and that the animals had you know died but their labor was then there stratified yeah. in the earth and that nineteenth century Britons should therefore think of themselves like these small microorganisms who were laboring away to make rock and that they too would then be sort of deposited in the um, very you know, geological strata. But then they would have no shape. Right, um, because the thing with microorganisms is that they weren't like, you could think of them as microfossils, but mostly they weren't identified as having, like, like, oh, there used to be a bug or something like that. It wasn't like that, it was, there's limestone or something like that. So they, they became the landscape right. rather than becoming sort of a, a thing in the landscape. Right. Um, so I was trying to think about that relative right. to the, the diagramming process that you were talking right. about, like right. making shapes with right. respect to land that can move. Right. Well, this goes to, I think, goes to uh, Mary Louise's argument or observation that this isn't, maybe this is a necessary and sufficient argument. It's not necessarily indigenous. Um, and in fact, the people that I know and work with, insofar as they are extroverted, they don't think it's necessary for you to be indigenous to be able to get this, right? Um, so indeed, that would be, uh, the, the right sitting there would be the possibility of enticing someone to take that imaginary and turn it and work it slightly differently so that your 
obligation to that which is sitting there isn't purely one of taking it and feeding yourself or something, right? But you can, you can build out of what I think can be known, right? One of them, the questions that for me and always has been is what keeps us, what keeps certain people from being obligated to a possibility that they're already dwelling in. For instance, you know that you are carbon and the carbons get, so, you know, there's ways of doing this. So what are the, what are the, how is late liberalism composed so it's continually deflecting us from seeing that? And I think that's what you were trying to get at when you were saying, um, the, the t say the techniques by which um, this geontology or this co-substantial obligation, which I'm, it's at the heart of this, is reinterpreted as sec, um, a reservation. Sequest uh, I can never say that word. Sequestation. Yeah. Um, ditto, what are the means by which we continually, when there is this, I'm, I, I'm, I'm feeling the obligation of co-substantiation and yet I have to be able to like cut it off in order to get certain kinds of goods. What are the affective and discursive frameworks that allow me to do that quickly and seemingly painlessly versus cultivating a disposition that would make doing that difficult? And, and there's parents and grandparents and us with our kids. We try and cultivate disposition that makes that more difficult. So that you feel yourself ripping. Does that? Yeah. Hmm. I don't know if this is related. I in your talk, I used the phrase exit ramp a number of times, and I started getting really distracted by it. Sorry. I just it's not actually in the talk, is it? Oh. <laughs> I guess it's it was. Because you're in California. I know, exit ramp. Why don't you even drive? I'm going to get out of your car. Exit ramp is what happens. The only place I drive is just anywhere in the road, as we say. Sorry, okay, so exit ramp. So, <laughs> so on the one hand, there were these kind of the, the new destiny, yeah. which maybe is like the highway, and now we're taking a different one. But exit ramp often seemed to be used as to kind of say, well, they took the easy way out. They got off early. And they, I don't know if it meant that they didn't do the hard work or something. Like the exit ramp toward totemism and animism. Uh -huh. it, the uh, the yeah. implication uh -huh. seemed to be that that was easy, and I guess I wanted to just push uh, back. And... No, no, I didn't. Okay. No, as a matter of fact, I, I, I sorry, yeah, the exit ramp. <laughs> uh, no, I, actually, I, I don't know. I guess I, not being a driver, I think the exit ramp, I, I see it as a positive thing, like getting out of the traffic. Um, no, I, I think it's a real, it's a very serious attempt to find a space in which a spacing can happen. That's it, right? And I'm very clear what I mean by a spacing. It's like with, I was saying this morning with queer theory, I mean, I've been, I never teach queer theory much anymore, but I'm teaching it. And it's kind of a genealogical <clears throat> class insofar as I really try and get folks to look at the, what I would say is a beginning in which, say for instance, Rubin pulled apart sex, gender, and sex sexuality. Huh. Now we, it's not that we have two things, and we also have a space, right? And I, I do think that folks who are trying to rethink animism or vitalism are n not doing an exit ramp insofar as, you know, now they're out of it, but rather are querying in this sense. That is, okay, what would it be if we made, maybe exit ramp's not good, but made a spacing? What, what, would, what wouldn't we be able to say anymore without tripping over ourselves? What words would emerge 
to characterize this new kind of space, so, like that. What, what the exit, the, the, but I do also honestly think that a lot of us want an exit ramp in the other sense of the word, which is we'd like to find a place, we'd like to get off, and it, even if we don't know the destination, feel like we're on some road that is out of the traffic. And, and so it is also, you're right, me saying, you know, there's not an out of the traffic. So let's, when, we're, when we're doing this, let's remember all the places that there are these, they put the traps out so they can either extinguish us or s suck the energy into this other thing. So I was just outlining a couple of them. Now, this yeah. brings to mind something that, then that um, I was, as you were talking, I was thinking about um, the argument that gets made that within the, the, history, the, we, the history of the West, mm -hmm. or within European thought, their ex, an, the attempt mm -hmm. to revive animism, that there were, there exists, mm -hmm. and this is an argument that Akhil Bilgrami mm -hmm. made that produced a huge polemic, mm -hmm. um, yeah. about that there are traditions within the West that were, were d demonized or suppressed mm -hmm. that yeah. had alternative um, views of the world. And in particular, he talks about the moment where um, there was a, um, a, there was Newtonian science mm. which saw the world, sees the world as inert, as inherently mm. inert. Mm. And there was other kinds of thought that it very soon saw the world as inherently suffused with value. And therefore, your, uh, either every relation in, to the world in the world was always already ethical. And he, he, mm. he kind of does a kind of sort of genealogy showing the moment at which, in fact, in both, both traditions were religious, both traditions were Christian. And it was the moment at which the Anglican church in England opted for Newton and said he's right, that the other tradition became, went underground. So there's an, the exit ramp is also, there's also an underground, yeah, that's <laughs> or people cool. argue within the West, there's an intellectual underground mm -hmm. in which these things remain possible. And that underground doesn't go away, it continues to reproduce itself, it just doesn't get named. Which well, is what I, sort of what I'm, one of the things I was suggesting. That. Well, I think the other thing you were <laughs> suggesting that, uh, maybe suggesting in ways that I agree with in the other suggestion, <laughs> so I'm trying to pull you over to my side. Uh -huh. But the, yeah, these like if you think of a Spinozian yeah, and tradition, the, right? We could say that, it, and not just purely Spinoza. You, you know, a lot of you'd have to be more Deleuzian and say it's like a it's an assault on Spinoza as much as a reading of Spinoza. But in any case, mm -hmm. that that if everything has the same right to persevere in being rock, riverbed, that lady who lays down, pen, body, this book, this thing sitting here, whatever, whatever it is. Um, nevertheless, one, everything I do means something is going to be extinguished, right? So, and the ethics that emerge out of that kind of straightforward looking is one in which you say, well, um, I'm going to have to extinguish you because this I want to persist, and I know that you have to be extinguished if this persists. But the ethics that merges out of there, if you don't have a hierarchy, are really weird because you can't justify your extinguishment based on the hierarchy of life. So that's within, say, the West. The, for, what, for me, what's interesting is what makes any of these workable or not workable. Okay, so let's say that friends of mine want to do their geontology in this world, or say their parents and grandparents, they try to do, they use their analytics and make, try to make it work in the world in which they were living. Well, it, be, it didn't work on one hand because of the structure of law and the imaginary of the tradition. So the law said, no, if you're gonna be traditional, you have to be inert, you're not inert. Yes. Doesn't matter that, wow, this is an incredible analytics. It's, it's a movable analytics and therefore it doesn't work. It's not practical. It doesn't, at that level or it, from that perspective, it's not able to do something in a kind of American pragmatist kind of sense. But 
although it wasn't able to do that, it did something else. It produced their kids as weirdly obligated to it, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? And now they are trying to, can, can what they want to do work? Literally, can, what can it do in the world, right? What does it, as they do it, what does it make them? Does it make them traditional people? Does it make them, you know, what does it do? And for the West as well, like if you want to pull up or just characterize and give sh better shape to one of these things that are inside here, can it work? What does it do? And in trying to make it work, what do we see about the organization of power mm -hmm. as it currently exists? Yeah. So it, it, in, there are potentials in the, in the West, there are potentials outside the West. But again, for using the figure of a trap, how as they try and come to be more actually is a whole set of forces sitting there and making them be something else. That's what actually interests me as much because then it's an analytics of power. At the same time, it's an attempt to think about potential alternatives to power. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for the enlightenment of both interventions. Uh, I was wondering, and I've been thinking a little bit about these issues, uh, if <coughs> quantum physics mm -hmm. can help us mm -hmm. to cross over into the into animism, mm -hmm. course, and uh, try to understand why, for instance, in some indigenous languages, like the language of the Benejon or Inigulaza in Oaxaca, has the ability to give animation to apparently non-animated object. And that is done by a decision of the speaker, referring to a stone. And uh, the Chippewa argue, and this is, has been written by some anthropologists a few years ago, that the stones can, can move and that they have life and energy. Mm -hmm. And quantum physics tell us that, in fact, stones have energy and dispense energy, and so you can calculate the age of it. So I wonder if uh, a new frontier for anthropology and cultural study in all of us mm -hmm. is, uh, has to be pushed toward quantum physics. Mm -hmm. Have you thought about the position? Mm -hmm. Because I, I bought the quantum physics of Dumps and I didn't ask him to do it. Yeah, it's just interesting. I mean, there's a. Do you want to. Do you want, well, I, well, you, you think. I, the, yeah. I will say that when I, when I think about where humanism does not rule, I, phys, quantum physics is the first thing that comes to yeah. my mind. Yeah. That it's a, it's a place where the human is, is de centered. Right. You the in when quantum physicists f for them the the human is is in in minuscule and on a, you know completely marginal to whatever it is they think about. It, so although at the same time, I mean the 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 foundational fiction of mathematics is that the the particularly human form of cognition is capable of characterizing superhuman phenomena and thus elevates us insofar as we and only we can above all other things, even as it radically marginalizes it. The human. Yeah. And that's, again, so that's, the, that's this potential there in which it could be really opened and pushed, I think. But mm -hmm. both are occurring, I think, at the, at the same time. I think in terms of the I'm not sure quantum, I, I see what you're doing with quantum physics. That is, factually, if you look at rocks, they actually are animate, i.e. there's movement and energy. And um, so, and one can mobilize the imaginary facticity to do work. And I, th so that'd be great. I don't care really, That's that would be fine. Um, I, Yeah. 
think when we're thinking about the facticity of physics, it's important not to remember, not to forget the kinds of labor that were necessary to produce that facticity. Yeah. I think that's where the problem comes in. Yeah. Is well, yeah, what do you have to do to create those facts? Like, yeah, yeah. That's right. What like what are the what what endures and what is exhausted? Yeah. Yeah. I think that's right. I, I, no, I, I actually, I do think it's right. It's just I've been trying to think how to bring this back to the question of finitude, which is w one of the things you brought up, which is so, and so that's what the work I was doing when you were trying to think, because it's, there is, there's something that displaces humanism, and I'm not sure if quantum physics does this work or not, which is when you say, can there be finitude outside of life, or is there not finitude? Like the whole... Oh, can anything that's not alive die? A or, and, question one, or, or... Yeah, exactly. What was the other... How the question two is there's not finitude. Oh, the, okay, or is, or is, there, or is the, the case that nothing dies? That, yeah. Yeah, yeah. There's nothing dies, and so mm -hmm. who cares if... The human. Di I mean, there is a when uh, one of the real, one of the you know, if there was a mind-boggling moment when I said, "What should we do with this archive?" And you know, and I remember it was Esther Jerem, and she said, "Burn it." I said, "What? We might need it for legal reasons." <laughs> but you know, I know I wouldn't be able to just torch it. You might be legally better off sometimes if you don't. I have it. yes, no, I go. That's why I knew it wasn't for legal reasons. That's about dig a hole and torch it. Or something. But but the other is, it's like. What is the obsession with human finitude? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure that if quantum physics does indeed, like Marilyn would say, like really make us minuscule, like the Anthropocene, according to Debesh, makes us minuscule, um, maybe then the question of finitude would be interestingly taken off the table. Um, but the Anthropocene works by making us all freak out about finitude. Yeah. Can I ask if, can I try and clarify for myself? Just, um, <coughs> so, like the particular analytics, the, 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 the content of their dwelling science is, was a response to the form that settler colonialism took. Okay, so it's emergent. 
and ditto with this augmented reality project that it emerged out of a problematic in contemporary late liberalism. And, you know, and I talked about what that particular project, it's not the same as their parents, it's different. And thus, and they're also, they have to pull it into being out of different conditions. Okay, so that's, and then you, say a deep ecologist, are pulling out of a particular place, which is not that place. Is that what you're saying? So they're, right. they're both responsive. Right. And, yeah? Yeah, right, right. Okay. So like, you know, let's say I'm that deep ecologist, right? Yeah. Can you teach me to draw the diagram so that my deep ecology walks over oh, yeah. to, to you? Right? Yeah. And can, yeah, and can you draw us the diagram so yours walks over to us? Well, I... And will quantum physics do that? Like, will quantum physics walk? To, yeah. um, to geontology. And I mean, I'm saying all of these are geontologies, but anyways. Um, yeah. Well, the factual answer is yeah, yeah, honestly, because there are deep ecologists who wander by. And the, uh, down the road in uh, Wendy's country, uh, every year the Greens the radical greens have a meeting there. They do their thing there, and then we go and um, and I describe that this one's taking E and that one's on. Then they we all have conversation. So, is there factually are there conversations? Yeah. Do in this the meant to move, made to move. They're both made to move. And I think, you know, what emerges between these two modes of moving and embedding, composting, the compost cycle, what we presuppose about the, how substance works or not. I, it's part, I just, you know, I feel like, I don't know, the proof is in the pudding. It's all. It's all here, so yeah, it will emerge out of there. Um, I don't know how to say it more better than more better than that. Is that? I mean, but it's a weak answer, other than yes. That, that. What would be a strong answer? No. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's always true. Well, well, no, I know. One or the other. I guess. I guess part of it. I mean, part of it is like, honest to God, that's why I like the compost. Marcel said, "I want. I have a question. I want to talk about the compost cycle." And what I like about the compost cycle is, fortunately or unfortunately, speaking of Anglicans or not, you know, I'm very not very transcendental. So I just think these things emerge from these problematics that are encountered, the source of which are obviously we are all post trains local. We know where this coming from could be very far away. And they tie and then they're tied into something else and then that creates the thing and then they die and go in here and then that creates it's like comp thought is compost for me, let alone bodies. And so I just don't know how to I just think, yeah, because there's not going to be the exit ramp in that other sense. A transcendental ideal or yeah. Maybe just a strong, a stronger question would be, can mining walk? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. And yeah, the right. metaphors of yes. burying and composting yeah. versus just removal. And I'm thinking of a friend of mine who yeah. was just telling yeah, that's me a good, that yeah, in that's Canada good. there's yeah. a Swedish company that's has, that's negotiating right now with the First Nations to buy all the biomass, anything that's left over from dams or logging is going to be shipped over in order to create greener burning fuels that will get them out of paying certain types of EU taxes. Mm -hmm. But just this idea that everything can be taken mm -hmm. yeah. and made useful somewhere else. So this is a yeah. Well, but that's why it's very interesting, the question of the cosmological. Because for that to work, one has to see themselves in as part of a world, I think, in which you know what we do here, um, matters 
But if we can think of it in a la larger way, then if you take this and you put it over there and this gets this, it actually ends up coming back here better, s still rubs up against that lady laying down and whether she has the right to persevere, the, whether she has a say in it. And if she, and what, you know, it's that whole like, and when we say she has a say in it, right? So, so, so I, the, the, so the weak, really weak question is I don't know. It depends if one starts to form and, and a geontology of that more globally situated movement. Um, I think. I have a question about the compost thing. So, so I actually think the I should do just one more. I, I, I think I, I'm very, like, I'm, and I wrote a little completely wacky thing. I, I still, I don't even know what I was talking about, honestly. Um, uh, but I know I was trying to talk about something. Um, and it was about, it was, on, it was in this book about cosmopolitics. I don't even know if it's out yet, so. Yeah, and it was, and I was trying to figure out, like, exactly how I, you know, what's the relationship between indigeneity and cosmopolitanism, even radical cosmopolitanism. And it seems to me that that this view of the earth and us all in the earth uh, is at least in deep tension with the kinds of more nuanced, uh, obligated substances, substantial ethics that one is working with. Intention with? Or? Tension, yeah. T what did I say? I didn't, hear, I didn't know if oh, you said tension or detention. Tension. Oh, intention. Well, the detention's cool. Um, <clears throat> with the line, with all their different kinds of lines of sight, which I just think is very, I mean, I don't know what to do with it, but the line of sight is really quite interesting. Like all those primitive lines of sight with the Europeans before they knew it was round and how crazy was that? But what happens to obligation when you have to think of it globally versus think of it, its effects here? Like, could you stop it if we thought its effects were here? Would that interrupt capital, perhaps? Like, if I said, well, sure, it might be in this dream of sustainability, and so I'm not supposed to be seeing this pit here. See, this is, for me, is like tense. Don't see the pit right here. See the green fuel over there. Don't see the harm here. See what will have been saved and how this will have been redeemed then, which will have been in the kind of future interior. Those kinds of things I, and you know, my friends worry about, like don't care about this pit. But if I cared about this pit, maybe we could stop the whole thing. If everyone cared about their own little pit, this was what you were, wasn't that you? Yeah. About ground, ground yeah. territorializing, yeah. grounding them. Yeah, I think that's really right. Yeah, indigenous territorialized conflicts. This lagoon, this place, this lake. Um, if we stopped it here versus the dream, capital dream of, or liberal capital dream of, like, in the end, it will all be perfectly sustainable, which is not, I mean, what would the, what would happen? I'm glad you brought up this co the cosmopolitanism question because yes. I have this is the, something I have been exercised about as well, and yes, it is, I and know. Um, as a kind of one of the forms of I've been working on this this project called planetary longings, mm. and one of the planet cosmopolitanism is one of the forms of planetary longings that come up, and uh, it you know in its I, of course, really have resisted the attempt to revindicate this term, mm. right? Mm. Uh, and, um, but, and there's many things to be said about it, but one of the things that, that, that puts it in tension with indigeneity is exactly that it, the cosmopolitan subject is a subject who 
belongs nowhere is rooted Just nowhere embedded, yeah. is equally everywhere yeah, and that's right. and and that's a subject that is is never sees itself as is never operates as accountable to where they are at this moment that's right and so there right. there yeah. that the the kind of canonical cosmopolitan yeah. subject or the, yeah. the is is um, isn't is, it doesn't have that. Isn't embedded. Isn't yeah. isn't isn't. It's not that they're never embedded. It's that it doesn't have that that capacity, it, or that sense of obligation. Yeah. Whereas the true fact is, wh whoever cosmopolitan you are, you you live in a body, and your body is always somewhere. Right. It is always in an ecology, impacting that ecology, in that environment. It's in it. You're doing it. You're consuming. You're composting. You're whatever it is. You're there, yeah, that's right. and and you, if you're going to have cosmopolitanism, you have to have that dimension. You would have to have that dimension in it, yeah. and um, so then there you, there are other ways of doing that. Like a, one example that someone told me. Um, this is someone in in uh, Alberta. We're talking about um, a thing that happened out there. There's a lake called Great Slave Lake, and around there there were um, uranium mines, and the people who live there. Who are the indigenous people were worked in those mines, and years later, they there was a cancer epidemic. They didn't know what they, what it was they were mining, and weren't they weren't told. And there was a cancer epidemic, and people got sick for over a long period. And finally, it came to light that they had been mining uranium, that had made them sick, and that the uranium they had mined had been used to make the bombs that had bombed <laughs> Japan, the <laughs> nuclear bombs. Hydrogen. So, atomic, atomic bombs. So the, um, I don't know if the story is, uh, I don't know. How, I, I, I'm, this is a story that I that was it was a told to me. The response of the community was to send. We must go to Japan and apologize. Mm. We did not know what we were doing. We did not know. No one told us, but we did it, and we need to apologize. And I'm mm. like, okay. That's a cosmopolitan. You can yeah, call that right. you can call that cosmopolitanism right. if you want as an alternative or right. a different thing. Right. Right. But right. what do you what do you? I'm not sure that's what. Is, that's not. Is that the reason for using that word? That's what. I, that's yeah, my dilemma. That's, that's, that's right. a word. That's right. Well, that, is it that but word, I think that's or do you want another word? Beautifully put, because again, the indigenous has always been about sequiz. Oh God, about sequestration. Sequestration. <laughs> well, I don't know why that word's so hard for me. Yeah. Accident. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, accident, I do. Um, that's opposed to the cosmopolitan view. Yes. And in fact, the, the example you're giving is exactly the right example because it's the, in, what the, in, if there's anything the indigenous does, which is not the indigenous, right, is to say we're foregrounding how what we do here impacts that's why those, the, those people with their lines out impacts where we don't even know where it goes, right? Mm -hmm. And it's a call for others to, who are equally embedded, mm -hmm. absolutely, to put that same obligatory relationship, composting or otherwise, in the forefront. Then what becomes cosmopolitan is indeed very different. We, whether it was technically our fault at all, we find it our fault because for whatever reason we were either unable or unwilling or whatever it was to hold rightly here and that went there. Mm -hmm. But cosmopolitanism as it's been and as like liberal mining capital does, it says, no, just disembed yourself from the thing that is under your feet, in front of you, that you are experiencing for a future promise in which what's under your feet, what's really happening to you, what's happening right now here has not happened. That, that's the disembedding form of cosmopolitanism that mm -hmm. I think, yeah. That, Okay, a disembedding form is a great. Yeah, that's it's a really disembedding. It's 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 abstraction. It's disembedment. Disembedment. Disembedding. Really, take yourself out. Yeah. More questions? Go ahead. I have a, this, this is, I think.
think somewhat related to the question that came about the need the colleges. Yeah. Um, but I was wondering how we have this sort of idea of indigenous and uh, these ideas of ontologies and oncology. How do we look at something like um, like something like the sensuousness of some of these ecologies or ontologies? I'm thinking of say. Um, some stuff I've read where they talk about uh, you know groups who live in forests and you know that the sense of the forest is not a kind of space which has trees, but that there's a completely different sense of space such that it's you know three dimensional. The place they live in is three dimensional in a very specific way, and uh, the emergence of any kind of two dimensional space where the horizon you know where a horizon appears is a I mean is a, the, the substance of a catastrophe. I mean, it is a catastrophe. So I mean, I'm just kind of, you know, wondering about you know, what is it that allows, you know, allows us to kind of move between a situation like a sort of form of life or a situation like that and something like um, what you're describing, which seems to be, but it seems that there's a very different kind of landscape. You know? And what is it that allows us to, you know, move among these different kinds of uh, I don't know what to call them like landscapes or ecologies, but I think that itself is already to perform a kind of commensuration, which is kind yeah. of what I'm trying to ask about. So I'm not yeah. sure, there's a way in which you cannot ask the question. So it makes me wonder about something like, um, something like the larger implications of a concept like indigeneity and, you know, one way I was thinking of, I mean, I understood this question about the deep ecologists is, I feel like there's a kind of question to me of what is the, uh, I guess I would say, what is the kind of criterial form of late liberalism? Like, maybe it doesn't require a criteria to be applied, and it's perhaps it's not an analytical concept in that sense. But I mean, something like even like in Wittgenstein, the way you know, pain yeah. is a kind of criterial category. Yeah. It has a very strange kind of ground. It's something like this. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it, it was a really interesting conversation that was happening at the AAA. Um, around and I'm going to turn it just slightly, and then hopefully we're all, we, we can. Try. AAA is the American Anthropological oh, so Association, sorry. which just had its meetings. Anthropology land. Um, over the what happens to politics and ethics when the end of politics isn't commensuration or pluralization. For me, pluralization the same as commensuration, right? Um, but instead, we're looking exactly in the, the very awkward way in which I answered, I think, the question, which is, like, I don't know how, if you tied it together here, what would, what kind of shape would, configuration would emerge? I, I, I don't know. Like, I'm not in that forest. We're saltwater people, right? There's nothing high to give perspective, and so I don't, I don't, I don't know. Um, nor do I necessarily think there is the like with the cosmopolitan imaginary. There's an end. There's the there is this the 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 kind of polity that is commensurated vis-a-vis -vis the human which is one and the world which is one, right? And if we could see ourselves as all the same human occupying the same planet, and you can see, you know, some of the environments, if we can do that, then we can find a way in which we can sustain the planet and the human and and that solution is a solution that depends on a certain technology of commensuration that I see deeply implicated in value, liberal value and capital value. So I just inherently think, mm, you know, not only do I think it's false, but I, I worry about that. So 
I, I guess it's my way of answering in the same way, is that I think these are, there's a general invitation that I think we can kind of see, you could almost say it was general around, if you wanted to have a general thing, composting, <laughs> right? Or, or an ethics of material obligation through this thing. How, where, what forms, you know, these are, if I remain theoretically true to what I do, which is kind of imminent critique, then, then where a particular arrangement s seems to face the most difficulty doing something, being practical. This is late Wittgenstein. Like, you know, it's not what it means, it's what it's able to do. Can it, do we see that, do we see this thing and say, not only do I doubt it, but I can't even understand what you're doing. Then it seems to me that's a space in which we can start analyzing the structures of power that may, that making it impossible as an action. And then I think I get somewhere. But that's how I analyze things. And it, it's not from a kind of normative ideal that it does or doesn't conform mm -hmm. to. But it's an action that clearly has a shape and yet, <clears throat> or we must kill it. Or it's a reaction to the attempt to build something that I build an analytics of power out of. And it's very different than deciding whether indigenous or not indigenous it meets a certain kind of normative criteria. And then I say yes or no. Mm -hmm. yeah. it's a, so it's a, I guess it's just a different way in which I move. Yeah, or you, but I think, to, I don't think of the, con, the concept of indigeneity as fixed in a criteria. Oh, no, yet. I don't either. We, yeah. It's going to, yeah. it yeah. will outlive no, its usefulness it and it will move yeah. on to something else. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. You said an ethics of material obligation. Materialized obligation. obligation. Okay, materialized obligation. And I have to say, it's, it comes out, it was in the Economist book in which I'm, one of the really cool, one of the problems that imminent critique faces, and there are several, um, one of which is, although we say, you know, these spaces of intensified indeterminacy are, are the place in which um, a potential political th otherwise is right. most, is, will emerge, but at the same time, perhaps paradoxically, it's also the, the, these are the places when you look at them kind of materially, they're most likely not to because the, 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 the ability to endure this radical shuffling is just, it's ex so it's a whole point of exhaustion. And, exhaustion. Yeah. Um, another problem that I think imminent critique, and again, me who kind of aesthetically is wedded to this face is um, uh, justification, the way in which political theorists like Nancy Fraser for a long time and Habermas has critiqued Foucault and others, that is, okay, but how do you decide which project, say which indigenous, which mining, which alternative social project of the clamoring millions and billions of them out there do you, are you going to support and help pull into the world? So, and it, on what basis? So it's basically the problem of adjudication. And I do think it's a problem. It's like, yeah, we can't adjudicate if you don't have some kind of hierarchy of values against or some kind of normative value against which you judge something. Um, and you can't be responsible, it's not responsible that's at stake, it, but instead it's like the sensuous, it's a kind of sensuous, I find that I am, I find that I am obligated to this. That is, it's retrospect, it's a kind of retrospective um, diagnostic of the body's commitment before you knew it to something. Uh, and whether or not you will, how you use that as a diagnosis. So, 
So, and that's what, again, what these older people were trying to build. They were trying to build bodies that were obligated, that one found themselves to be obligated before you even knew it. So, like these, you know, the people who are now my age, is this a choice? Is it, like, are they being responsible? That's really not cutting it. It's like they kind of have to do this. Mm -hmm. Even as, you know, it, you could say, well, we could work to not have to do it. I kind of have to keep on going back. Why am I responsible? No, because I can't not do it. Why? Because in this kind of like a sensuous interpretive, I don't even know what to say, a plankton that just goes through the light or something. But it, it, this notion of materialized obligation throws so many of our political intuitions off track. Like it's not, it's not reflexive reason I've decided to do this because you know, and if I'm going to change the way I've been materially obligated, it's not, it's more with Foucault, it's, it, it's a ascesis that I have to engage in. Um, also a mourning that I have to engage in. Also probably a melancholy I have to engage in, all of which continually tells me, you know, you were made here. You were made by this, by these particular people in this particular place. And if you want to be unmade, then you're going to have to pull and unflesh yourself. Mm -hmm. And that foregrounds the embedded nature of subjectivity rather than a kind of cosmopolitan disembedding. And I think it goes more to the sensuousness of it. Um, Which anthropology historically is a discipline Suppressed, oh, suppressed, sequestered, they erased. Hate it. You had, and there was this. Yeah. You had to go do your fieldwork and come back. And I would watch Absolutely. this. Absolutely, I would watch Absolutely. this from the outside because I I'm, yeah. mm. have a lot of connections to anthropology, but I'm not an anthropologist. And mm. I watch anthropology graduates come back yeah. with this, yeah, and then have to sit down and convert it all into some depersonalized thing that was going to be their dissertation. So the, trans the self-transformation of anthropology yeah. has been very, very important. Yeah, that's right. And it's not as if it's universally so, <laughs> I assure you. <laughs> you know, and, and all I want is that, for me, the dwelling science, and it's interesting, the dwelling science as a phrase emerged in between thinking about this Geontology as a practice and the method of anthropology itself, mm -hmm. which said it was a dwelling science, but it didn't want to have any consequences in terms of its own materialized obligation. Yes, right. That is, it came to the whole argument of anthropology was dwelling in was the condition of producing legitimate knowledge about. And the dwelling in was important because it sensuously reformed you. It literally reconstituted your uh, habitus. But that shouldn't actually be permanent or anything, right? It should be just controlled. And I think it's still not something that, that uncontrolled material. We're not obligated to what, to the conditions by which we produce knowledge. Some are, mm -hmm. lots are not. Lots are not. Lots are not, which, you know, whatever. Okay. So Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>